My name is Aude. I'm a PhD student at uh, IE in Madrid. And I'm going to present today a paper I'm working on with my advisor, Juan Santalo, also at IE. It's a project we have been working on for quite some time now, and I'm very excited about it. It's the first time I'm going to present it, so please feel free. Any feedback, any question is welcome. Uh, so the idea of this paper is to investigate the difference between listed and unlisted firms and to look especially at how they invest differently across countries and across industries. So why did we decide to study this topic? Uh, talking to people, reading the press, we realized that there seemed to be quite significant difference between private firms and public firms, public meaning listed in that context, and that probably these differences had big consequences for firm strategies, but that we didn't know much so far, at least not in the management literature, on private firms. And one of the reasons being that so far we don't have a lot of data on them. So I don't know if you can read it properly. I would just quote maybe two sentences. Public companies have always had to put up with more regulations than private ones because they encourage ordinary people to risk their capital. And another one, our whole philosophy is built around doing things for the long term. It just becomes a lot harder to manage if you are public. You can't pick your shareholders. So that was really the starting point. And um, so we, we, we read the literature. There is some work on private firms uh, in the business family business, uh, in the family business uh, literature mostly, or in entrepreneurship. But they all study kind of sub sub parts of private firms, not private firms as a whole. And there is also uh, some and a lot of work in finance literature, but it's mostly about why firms go, go public, but not necessarily about what happens next and what impact this ownership, ownership form has on uh, firm strategies after they have been public. So that was the idea. Uh, so we <laughs> tried to investigate uh, what environments are more favorable to listed firms versus private firms. And we try to look at both institutions, uh, some cultural variables, and uh, there was also some industrial variables, but we, we only have one here. So the idea to look at uh, why firm investments, because it's a critical, I mean, it's critical in strategies to build your competitive advantage, to protect it from your competitors, and uh, also because <laughs> that was uh, another reason, because we didn't trust so much the performance data on private firms, so that's also the reason why we looked at investment. So to make the link with a uh, today conference topic, uh, for a while, there were not so much studies about uh, differences in ownership types and how institutions impact that because uh, ownership types and institutions were supposed to converge in the long term, kind of. So <laughs> it, maybe there would not be so many differences. And even if, if there were going to be differences between private and public, then um, they would not differ across countries. But Guess what? I mean, I think it has been pretty clear since yesterday that it didn't happen. So, so that's why uh, we try to look at um, the differences in uh, institutions and their impact on private and public firms. So the idea was to start with differences between private and public firms. So we identified three of them based on the literature. The first one is ownership structure and uh, regulation. Ownership structure, it's known that there is... Uh, uh, more differences be between control and uh, management, and more discrepancy, sorry, between control and management, meaning interest between managers and shareholders diverge more in public companies than in private ones. And you have a larger number of shareholders, so it's more difficult to monitor, manager, and everything. So, uh, so based on this, uh, government passed a lot of regulations, different regulations across country, to kind of protect shareholders of the public firms. So that was the first uh, difference. And the second difference was time horizon. So uh, you have, it, again, you have uh, some empirical literature showing that you should be more short-term oriented in a public firm because you have the pressure from shareholder, because you have pressure from institutional shareholders in, in, um, in some cases, uh, and also because you have a um, long-term commitment which is uh, stronger in private firms because if you divest, of course, you divest a large share and the price is going to drop. So that's it. And the last um, difference is cost of capital because you can access a, a larger pool of uh, shareholders uh, and also because you will be able to reduce uh, uh, information asymmetry. You will have a, a cheaper cost of capital in public firms. At least you are supposed to. And, uh, and the idea is that 
you will have uh, institutions, uh, culture and industries shaping this, and, in, and together they will influence private and public investment. So we have a few hypotheses. I will, we will, I will go to them into more detail. Um, sorry, how, how much time do I have? Seven minutes, so I will go very quickly. Uh, okay, so the baseline hypothesis is mostly the cost of capital hypothesis. That list, listed firms are supposed to invest more than their private counterparts. First, moderation is that um, investments of uh, public firms will also depend on managers' discretion. For two reasons. First, you have the agency theory perspective, saying that Managers have a tendency to overinvest. They, because they want to run larger firm, it will get them a higher pay. That kind of, uh, that kind of benefits. So, uh, if you don't put the proper mechanism into place, they will tend to overinvest. The second one is, in listed firm, you also have more regulation to follow. You need to disclose. You need a lot of, of uh, regulation. You have more transparency, etc. So it's more difficult for you to do a quick investment. So there are some investment opportunities you might miss. So for these two reasons, we believe that when you put regulation in place in a country which limits the managerial discretion of managers, then listed firms will tend to invest less than their private counterparts. So that's one. Um, next one is more uh, about, again, an argument on cost of capital and uh, protecting minority shareholders so meaning making sure, putting regulation into place to make sure that they won't be expropriated by majority shareholders will help them be confident in investing in the firm and the firm will have access to a cheaper capital. And again, it will help it invest more. And in that case, on the contrary, it will tend to invest more than uh, its private counterparts. Then um, there is also the effect of uh, cultural values. So managers have a trade-off. They can either uh, choose to take the long-term perspective or they can choose to take the short-term perspective, and especially when you speak about investment, because uh, they can decide that if they postpone some investments, they will make a bigger profit this year. And what, what happens next? That's it. <laughs> so so short-termism, is, 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 again, there is some empirical literature showing that it's associated with restricted investments. So we use some uh, cultural value from off study to show that some societies which are more long-term oriented will tend to invest more. But this will be counterbalanced in public firms uh, that would still have this pressure from, from the market, from the stock market, and will, be, will not be able to follow this trend. So in general, firms will invest more in long-term oriented societies but to a lesser extent for private firms, or public firms, sorry. And this one I will, I mean, it's about industry, I don't think it's the focus today. <laughs> so, okay, so what we did, we used um, information collected by Bureau Van Beek, which is a Belgian firm. So they collect information on private firms. So what we did is we matched, actually, for each listed firm we identified in our sample across the world, a similar private firm in same country, same industry, and we try, and, and then once identified, we looked at all their investment were evolving, and so we were able to compare more than 6,000 firms in 14 countries and to look at how they were, they were investing. So, uh, so that's a uh, dependent variable is a firm investment in uh, fixed assets because I, mean, I, don't know, I don't know if I should go into detail, but uh, maybe very briefly, we didn't want any recurrent activity into that, so we didn't look at total asset, fixed asset instead. We have a dummy to identify listed firm. We use an index developed by Laporta et al. to measure manager discretion, and we use for that um, a measure of shareholders' rights, like if they can vote easily, if they can vote by proxy, how much capital do they need to, to call for a shareholder meeting, that kind of things. And we say, okay, if they have a lot of rights, automatically it reduces the managerial discretion. So that's our measure. To protect uh, minority shareholders, we use an index developed by Chang Jankov and also La Porta in 2008, uh, which has been used quite a lot actually in the, in the literature, to measure the protection of minority shareholders of listed firms against expropriation by majority shareholders. 
society long-term orientation, we, we used a measure developed by Ofzede, and uh, referring to when, uh, um, when uh, culture is more long-term oriented, for example, Japan would be very long-term oriented, the US would be short, very short-term oriented, and that's it. And we control for firm age, profitability, size, and debt. Uh, so we, okay, so we got support for our hypothesis. One issue that was raised, so was that, uh, okay, maybe it's not uh, being listed that uh, means that you invest more or less. Maybe you become listed because you wanted to invest in the first place. So to control for that, we used an instrument. When we looked uh, at, uh, we used a dummy. Uh, whether the firm we were looking at was in the city of the main stock market of the country or not. And so using this, which is correlated with being listed or not, but which should not be correlated to firm <coughs> investment, we, we could control for that. And uh, interestingly, our results still hold, except the main effect of being listed, so it's actually quite interesting. Uh, intended contribution. Um, as we said, we, st we don't know much in the management literature on private firms, and it's a bit of a pity because it's the bulk of the economy in the end. I mean, it's, uh, and, and in addition, you have more and more firms in major economies going private, so we need to know, I mean, <laughs> what, what does it change? And, uh, like, for example, even recently, Dell went private, that kind of, uh, so, so we saw it was interesting to start lifting the weight on differences and how it can impact uh, private and public uh, company strategies. Theoretical contribution, yeah, we, we try to show that public listing is, yeah, <laughs> we use the, the, the word double-edged word because it brings you both advantages, cheap capital, but also a lot of constraint, like regulation, transparency, which can really be a drawback for, for a company. So that's it. And we also try to look a little bit behind institutions. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, <laughs> we are still using a country level variable <laughs> because we don't have anything so far, but we try to look a little bit further than regulation by introducing culture. And in terms of implications, practically, uh, the idea was to better understand firm competitive environment because ownership form should be part of uh, a strategic analysis of, uh, of a market or of a company. I mean, it's going to be very different if your competitor is a German private firm or if it's an American uh, public firm. And so far, it's, it's not really included in, in, in the existing frameworks. And, uh, and also, yeah, and also the last one was more maybe policy oriented, more to show that um, the, the impact of stock market regulations will really trigger some, uh, some effect on listed and un unlisted firms. And if you implement specific regulations for listed firms, then you will, you will really help them develop or not. So that's, and, and, and it can have uh, really an impact on society. I mean, that, that, that's really a personal comment to, to conclude, but I, I read in The Economist like last month, so we're actually taking a critical position about a lot of American firms getting uh, private and saying that public firms in the end were also a way for Mr. and Mrs. Smith to invest in the economy and benefits from its growth. Uh, and so if, and so it's, <laughs> it's a balanced, uh, so it's also, it also has some implications if you don't favor them. So that's it. Uh, yes, limitations. I'm not sure if I still have time, but uh, so the limitation is we have a sample of 14 countries, but I mean, uh, officially we cannot generalize be beyond that. Um, there were, yeah, there was some discussion on the indexes we used. Uh, and, the, and that's it. And for further for research, for further research, we also want to investigate um, more on the ownership side and look at owners' identities, both in private and public firm, because we think it will also have an impact. And that's it. Thank you for your attention. One question that I had is re regards to your use of Hofstad, the the, the Hofstad skill, mm -hmm. and um, I was wondering if perhaps. You thought about, you know, you use the example of the USA versus Japan, um, USA being more short-term oriented and Japan being more long-term yeah. oriented. Um, 
perhaps uh, you could have gone about it in terms of collectivist versus individual. And I was wondering if, if you had considered that, and if so, why yeah. would you have picked long versus short-term orientation versus uh, yeah. individual versus collective? Naturally, there are overlaps, but... Um, okay. Um, to be honest, we tried both, and we had no significant result with the other one, but the theoretical, the theoretical reason behind, behind choosing also long-term orientation is because we saw in the first place you really had a difference between private and public firm in, in, in that dimension. I mean, I, I just right now, I, w I wouldn't be so sure they are so different on the... Uh, on, on the, the other dimension you mentioned, uh, because and by construction, if you want to exit a private firm, you have less liquidity, so you cannot so easily exit it. So meaning you will necessarily have a long-term commitment, so that's also the reason why we picked this dimension, because to us it made more sense, but... Uh, but <laughs> um, but if I can just follow up on that. Um, the Hofstede is at country level, yeah. while what you just said is at the company level. So these effects should be irrespective, should, should not necessarily be aligned. In fact, that's hopefully what you wanted to show. So Hofstede would say yeah. the, the context in which this con these countries are operating may be longer term versus shorter mm -hmm. term. What you just said was the approach that the company owners would have relative to their own firms? Actually, there are two... Wait, if I can... Actually, we look at two things. We look at the main effect. So what you are saying is in a country which is more long-term oriented, companies will tend to invest more. And we agree with that. I mean, but what we are saying is this will be less true for public companies because they will also have this pressure from the stock market. So, the, uh, yeah, I, <laughs> no, I, I think we still agree on this. Yeah, just a short question. Um, when you consider the manager discretion, yes, sure. why haven't you included the um, offset dimension of uh, environmental um, control? The control of uncertain, uh, certainty, uh, uncertainty, uncertainty, and yeah. Uh, I mean, same, same kind of answer. I mean, we didn't see why, by definition, a public firm should have a different behavior in an uncertain lesson. So that's, that's why. <laughs> but. Uh, this is uh, completely out of ignorance. What are some of the biggest uh, private firms in the USA? And does the scale make them... Uh, uh, does difference in scale uh, make comparison difficult? Yes, very much, actually. Yeah, very much. Um, that's why we use this so matching exercise, actually. Uh, so, sorry. Uh, yes. That's why we use this matching exercise. In the end, we are comparing small public firms with large. So, yeah, you're right. I mean, maybe what you are, we are saying is only right for a certain size of firm. It's true, it's a limitation. So can you give me some examples of some uh, like big uh, private firms? Heinz or, uh, Heinz. sorry, oh, Heinz. Heinz? Yeah, oh, sorry. <laughs> My, uh, or Dell very soon. <laughs> Dell. <laughs> so. Actually, I have. It's not a question on the paper, but it's a question on on, on how to to uh, look beyond or move yeah. forward. Yeah. And I'm wondering whether actually you could not uh, learn a lot by having a focus on the dynamics of, of the move from public to private or from private to public. So, what generates the decisions yeah. for a firm to go yeah. one way or the other? Obviously, this would mean a much more qualitative type yeah. of uh, uh, methodology, yeah. but I think it could be very complementary yeah. to, to what you're doing, to introduce the, the, the dynamic dimension. Yeah, no, I completely agree. Um, also, one of the things I would like to do next is probably some qualitative things, but also looking more at the firm level, like what type of competitive environment, what type of uh, firm strategies will make a firm more likely to go private or to stay public, exactly. So that's hopefully <laughs> coming soon. <laughs> I'll ask a question. Yeah. Uh, I, I've read your paper, but you know, in the 
well, this is a suggestion. I, I have no idea how much time it might take for you. But if you can increase the sample size from 14 to, uh, you know, to include more emerging economies. Yeah. Because if you look at the data of how stock exchanges are proliferating across the yeah. world, yeah. it's like exponential from 1980s. Yeah. And many of them are in Africa, been in various parts of the world. So that would be interesting because to see, then you can partition and see how they function in developed yeah. economies. Yeah. Where, b because there's a historical reason, because uh, in many of the industri countries which became industrialized, Capitalism was in the service of nationalism, you see? Yeah. But in many of the emerging economies, they're still trying to grapple with uh, the idea of a nation state and how to make people into the economic life of the nation. Yeah. So that would be interesting. I, I don't know if you'll find any interesting results. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, yeah. So, yeah, so far, actually, our limit was this matching exercise because, but uh, maybe I can just have a look without matching. Maybe that would be interesting. But thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you.